Good afternoon, I'm Dennis Galecki. Welcome to the 445th Imagine Greater Buffalo program and another wonderful virtual Imagine lecture hosted by our Buffalo and Erie County Public Library. Thanks so much for joining us today. This program is created by the Center for the Study of Art, Architecture, History and Nature, or Cezanne as I pronounce it, and ImagineLifelongLearning.com. Now, we're going to start with our speaker shortly, but first, a little housekeeping. Everyone watching will be muted during our speaker's presentation, so if you have a question, please type it into the chat box and we'll get to as many as we can. This program is being recorded, so you'll be able to watch it again later on the Downtown Central Library's Facebook page and their YouTube channel, and we hope you share the link with your friends and networks. So now our featured speaker is Susan Butaccio. Uh, and Susan is going to speak about uh, the library. She's been a librarian since 2006, when she graduated from the University at Buffalo with a master's degree in library and information science. She worked as a teen services specialist at the New York Public Library from 2006 until 2012. In 2014, she began her career at the Buffalo and Erie County Public Library as a part-time librarian at the Lancaster Public Library. In 2018, she moved to the Central Library here in downtown Buffalo and served in the Children's Department until November of last year when she joined the Grosner Room, the Rare Books Genealogy, and the Local History Department. Now we're doing this as part of Erie County celebrating its 200th anniversary. And uh, uh, this is week three, so we look back uh, at history as we imagine, better imagine, our future. Uh, you will find that uh, the, the library system uh, literally goes back to about uh, uh, the beginning of the county and the city as well. So let's hear now from Susan. Susan, take it away. Thank you, Dennis. Um, let me just start off my, uh, my presentation. Wait one moment. Come on, there we go. So thank you for joining me today to learn a little bit about the history of the Buffalo and Erie County Public Library System. This will be a brief overview as it is difficult to fit 186 years of history into a 20 minute program, but you can learn everything you ever wanted to know about the library from books available in the Grover Room, which is our rare books, genealogy and local history department. Sources for this presentation include it's a long title, bear with me. The, the Buffalo Library and its building, illustrated with views, also brief historical sketches of the Buffalo Fine Arts Academy, the Buffalo Society of Natural Sciences, and the Buffalo Historical Society, which occupy parts of the building, published in 1887. The Buffalo Public Library, commemorating its first century of service to the citizens of Buffalo, 1836 to 1936, by Arthur Goldberg. The Time Was Right, A History of the Buffalo and Erie County Public Library from 1940 to 1975 by Joseph Rounds, as well as the published annual reports of the Young Men's Association and the Grosvenor Library. Um, I also wanna thank my colleagues in the Grosvenor Room for over the years, they have collected all of these wonderful photos and uh, there are different narratives that I was able to tap into for this. And I wanna thank especially Charles in the Grover, Grosvenor Room because he scanned a few extra goodies that I will be showing you today. So, the earliest history of the library as we know it today date back to 1836, when a young men's association formed to begin a subscription library. Coincidentally, the first meeting held in February of 1836 took place at the county courthouse located at Lafayette Square, a building that stood on the site of what is now the Central Library. At a time when Buffalo's population was counted at about 16,000 in total, and the county of Erie itself was only just created in 1821, 
400 men between the ages of 16 and 40 signed on to the idea of an association whose object was to establish and maintain a library reading room and to procure, procure literary and scientific lectures and to promote the intellectual improvement of its members. Earlier efforts to form a library resulted in the formation of the Buffalo Library as far back as 1816 and the Buffalo Lyceum in 1830, but these institutions did not take hold, though their collections, however, apparently later made it into the Young Men's Association's holdings. So it was a subscription library, meaning that you would pay to be able to take out books. Uh, subscriptions could be made in two ways. A life membership could be purchased for $50 or annual memberships could be purchased for $2 with a $2 initiation fee. Uh, you'll see here the um, image in the background with the CPL look to it is a lifetime membership that was uh, issued to John Evans by the Young Men's Association of Buffalo. Um, it's a pretty cool little uh, document. After an, an inaugural drive raised $6,755 for the establishment of the collection, the first location at 175 Main Street, located near what is now Seneca One Tower, was rented and Benjamin W. Jenks appointed the first librarian. The library would move at least two more times in its early years, from Main Street to South Division, Division Street, back to Main Street to what is known as the American Block. The administration of the library was determined by annual election. While librarians were appointed to manage daily operations, a president, executive committee, lecture committee, and many others were chosen by vote to run the association's various endeavors. Community input of this kind continued until the library became a publicly funded institution in 1897. In the early days, subscriptions and proceeds from lectures were not always enough to fund the YMA. Extra fundraisers periodically aided the association's finances. Uh, moonlight boat excursions on Lake Erie brought tidy profits. Um, there is the broadside advertising um, one of those moonlight boat ex excursions. Um, let's see. And um, let's see what else. Uh, and oh, one time they hired a diver to raise funds for an exhausted treasury. Clothed in his working dress and preceded by a band of music, he, the diver, was carried through the streets, his purpose to descend to the bottom of the lake for the benefit of the library. The diver descended and the funds were raised. <laughs> That's a description of an early fundraiser and a historical account of the library delivered at its 25th anniversary in 1861. So in 1865, the library relocated again to a building often referred to as St. James Hall on Main and Eagle Streets. The expanded quarters included a large room for lectures. As I mentioned earlier, bringing in prominent speakers was one of the main purposes of the association. A variety of eminent writers, scholars, and politicians were guests of the association, including Emerson, Thackeray, and Reverend Harry Ward, Henry Ward Peacher. Woe be it if a member's wife planned an evening party on a lecture night. The chairman of the lecture committee would consign that lady to utmost Hades for, inter for interfering with attendance. Regular lectures were an important aspect of the association's services throughout the 19th century. And you'll see here, this is a collection of lecture tickets for the 1861-1862 season. Uh, you'll note that the association was renting St. James Hall um, for large events even before it moved to the location in 1865. It was a well-known lecture hall, which they later um, purchased as their own space. So by the close of the 1870s, picking up stakes and moving again was a top priority. One of the most important causes for concern at its current location was the fear of fire. The library had already narrowly missed complete destruction in a fire at the American block, relocating to St. James Hall just 15 days before the previous location burnt to the ground. And so the association now wanted new fireproof accommodations for its collection in a freestanding building. A committee was formed to choose an appropriate location, and the abandoned county courthouse was chosen as the site for the library's first dedicated structure. To accomplish this, the call for designs was, was released, netting 11 proposed building plans from architectural firms. New York City's Cyrus Edlitz was named the, as the design winner over other well-known architects, including H.H. H. Richardson. 
Um, I love this picture because you'll see that the Hotel Lafayette was not yet built. Um, There's a church next door to the library. Um, at this time, the executive committee of the library also decided to rename the institution at the suggestion of its newest president, Jewett Richmond, to contradict the idea that the, that the library was an auxiliary of the benevolent and evangelical work of the Young Men's Christian Association rather than a separate secular institution. So many people ask if the, uh, the library was connected to the YMCA and no, we were always a separate institution, always a secular institution. Ten years later, oh, I'm sorry, in 1886, the legislator, legislature approved the rebranding of the library as the Buffalo Library. Ten years after that, the name evolved to the Buffalo Public Library, the result of an agreement with the city of Buffalo approved by the Common Council, making it a free, public, circulating, and referenced library for the use and benefit of the residents of the city of Buffalo. The old location, St. James Hall, was rented out as the Richmond Hotel after a renovation. Shortly after reopening, the hotel burned to the ground in 1887 in a terrible fire that claimed 15 lives. The library would later rebuild that structure as the Iroquois Hotel and touted that building as fireproof. The proceeds from the rental of the hotel would surge, serve as a large source of income for the library for several years. So that fear of fire was very legitimate. The city burned many times. There were very many, there were so many fires in, uh, in, in uh, the early years of, of cities in America. Now, the history of the Buffalo Public Library is not the only tale to tell. A second non-circulating library opened its doors in 1871, established with funds bequeathed to the city of Buffalo by a prominent merchant, Seth Grobner, who left $40,000 to the city to establish a public reference library back in 1857, 10,000 of which had to be dedicated to erecting a building. The Grosvenor Library, pictured here, built at the corner of Franklin and Edward Street in 1895, stood for almost a century. The Grosvenor collection was impressive and benefited greatly from generous gifts, including the first four folio editions of Shakespeare and the four volume elephant edition of Audubon's Birds of America. Uh, this collection forms a large part of our wonderful um, rare books collection here at the library and uh, specifically in the Grosvenor rare book room. And here, united for the first time is Seth Grosvenor and the library named after him. By the turn of the 19th century, the city of Buffalo was in possession of two fine public library institutions, but the YMA was also fundamental in the foundation of other important cultural organizations. As early as 1847, the YMA began organizing the collection of items beyond what would belong in a bookcase to cultivate the vast unexploited fields in Buffalo's intellectual life. Two special standing committees on local history and natural sciences would be instrumental in the formation of the Buffalo Museum of Science and the Buffalo History Museum, whose collections, along with the fine arts collection that would later form the basis of the Albright Knox, occupied floors of the library throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. So you'll see, um, I guess it's a dinosaur, maybe a woolly mammoth. I'm not even sure if they put it together right, but it was at the early uh, Buffalo, uh, the, the, the uh, natural history um, collection that was actually at the library. So this was inside the library itself. The YMA was instrumental in several other in innovations, including the early adoption of the Dewey Decimal System, the creation of one of the first dedicated children's rooms in a public library in the 1890s, Bringing literature to children and their families had long been a priority for the library as demonstrated by the Buffalo Plan. It was a system of school and classroom libraries created by the YMA that supplied Buffalo students and their families with easy access to materials. By 1883, the library offered free subscriptions to all children in the city and published a catalog of books for young readers, which you can look at in the Grosvenor Room. The library also created traveling collections for police and fire stations, factory workers, and hospital patients. And you'll see the picture in our lower right-hand corner is um, factory workers at the Pierce Arrow factory um, exploring the the traveling collection that librarians would refresh, usually weekly or monthly, just depending on the schedule. At the turn of the 20th century, Buffalo and Erie County was booming and the library expanded along with the city's population. 
While there were book depositories with limited hours in the earlier history of the library, in 1901, the first self-sufficient library opened, which maintained its own staff and schedule. Named for William Ives, a long-serving librarian, this began a period of building and growth. 18 more locations in the city of Buffalo would be built between 1903 and 1945. The Grosvenor Library also grew, opening a stunning reading room in the Cyclorama building on Edward Street. And because I can't get enough of these pictures, <laughs> uh, the picture at the top is the photo of the reading room in the Cyclorama building. If you remember the Cyclorama building, it is a circle. So it was a, just a giant round room <laughs> of books. And um, there are many pictures of people coming to that library, just filling up all the tables, looking for uh, books for their college papers or other research or that they might need to get done. Uh, at the lower left-hand corner are children at the Clinton Street Library in, I believe, 1947. And on the right-hand side is that William Ives building um, in 1901, the, the, the interior. So not only was the city growing during this time, but the surrounding towns and villages in Erie County were expanding as well. The Erie County Library was established in 19, oh, 1947 to service towns with a bookmobile and to assist autonomous community libraries with centralized administrative support. So all the various towns throughout the, system, throughout the county were making their own libraries. And instead of having everyone do their um, you know, repeat work of cataloging books and ordering books, uh, the county stepped up and began a central administration to help get that work done. Combining the Grosvenor Library and the Buffalo Public Libraries had been considered several times throughout the city's history, including in the early 1860s, but never came to pass until 1853 when the three separate library systems, the Buffalo Public Library, the Grosvenor Library, and the Erie County Library were merged into a single federated system, the Buffalo and Erie County Public Library, funded with county tax dollars. A new library, the Central Library, which stands today at Lafayette Square, was built on the site of the Eblitz building with the addition of an entire city block of real estate to house the library's ever-growing collection. Completed and dedicated in 1964, the Central Library is responsible for much of the collection development, cataloging, and processing of materials for the system. And you'll see here on our left is the Central Library when it was dedicated in 1964. I love those chairs. I wish we still had some. Maybe they're around in a basement or something, I'm not sure. Uh, and on the right is a library staff member um, reading to children on one of the bookmobiles. So um, throughout the 1960s and 70s, Erie County's finances remained stable. 24 more library buildings, such as the Lancaster Library photographed here, were built to support a growing suburban population. However, in the 1970s, the county's finances began to falter as changes in population destabilized the region's economy. Uh, if you ever have a chance to visit the Lancaster Public Library, it has been so beautifully maintained. It, you could walk in there and it's like walking back in time. It is really cool, right down to those beautiful hanging globes. It became clear that the library system could no longer properly fund the 52 branches that once flourished in the county. The erosion of the city and the county's industrial base and the subsequent depopulation of the area led to some hard choices, especially after a study determined that BECPL had more libraries per capita than any other system in North America. After several financial crises, the library was forced to close 16 branches in the system in 2005. The, library, the county library system was forced to consolidate, but proved resilient in years to come. In 2006, the Frankie Merriweather Jr. branch opened on Jefferson Avenue, named for the publisher of the region's oldest African-American weekly paper, The Criterion. This library also houses the William A. Miles Center for African-American Studies. In 2007, the Erie County legislator, Legislature passed the Library Protection Act, a permanent funding source for the library, enabling the system to stabilize finances and once again expand hours of service to the public. These days, the library continues to be an integral part of the services provided by Erie County, with 37 locations enabling access to books, technology, classes, and community. 
Innovative grants and partnerships have enhanced programming and services for residents throughout the area, including grants from NASA, the Ralph Wilson Foundation, the New York State Family Literacy Services Grant. Partnerships with community organizations and schools remain a priority, demonstrated by our work with some of our oldest partners, such as the Albright Knox, the Buffalo Museum of Science, and the Buffalo History Museum, as well as new partners like Explore and More, the Western New York Book Arts Society, uh, Young Audiences, the Hispanic Heritage Council and so many more. The library has also expanded our investment in connecting people with emerging technology with the establishment of the Techno Lab to present computer training to groups and individuals, and the Launchpad, which offers a recording and film studio, 3D printing, and hands-on hands -on activities to inspire folks of all ages. Many branches have libraries of things to connect community members with all manner of useful resources, from iPads and Chromebooks to karaoke machines and lawn games. The library continues to innovate to meet people where they are, with a new bookmobile making the rounds, along with a Books by Mail program established for, to send books to those who cannot make it to the library in person, as well as a large collection of ebooks for folks to read anywhere. After 186 years, the library remains a place for education, entertainment, and community, which could not happen without the support of the county, community partners, and the people that we serve. So thanks for listening uh, to my quick, quick version of the library's history. If you have any questions, I'll try my best to answer them. Susan, that was outstanding and uh, uh, really is a way to look at the county. I'd, I'd be curious, uh, and you may not know offhand, but where, do we, where does the formation of the library system, as you pointed out, goes back to 1836. This must have been one of the earlier um, city libraries uh, in the country. Are, are, uh, is, do you have any sense of when the first ones were? I'm sure in the New England area, uh, if I had to guess, or New York City or uh, uh, thereabouts, but uh, where do we fit relative to uh, the earliest libraries? Well, I my understanding is that one of the first subscription libraries in America was started by Benjamin Franklin um, in Philadelphia, and it was um, sort of a thing where people would get to back together to discuss and uh, debate events of the day. And I believe it was in Philadelphia that Benjamin Franklin was told everyone to bring their their personal libraries so that they could look up uh, um, facts and figures and enhance their debates. So um, our subscription library started in, in many, in, in much the same way that, um, you know, people would get together and, you know, to, you know, basically prove their points, they would bring all of their precious books and share them together to expand everybody's knowledge. Wonderful. So, um, yeah, and I know, I think that this library, this is me sort of editorializing a little bit, but, you know, people have asked why it was a young men's association, not just an association. But I think that, you know, back in this time that you're, it, that the Buffalo area itself was still pretty wild. It was still kind of a, an unsettled area. The Erie, Erie Canal had opened only 10 years beforehand. And I think that maybe the library itself was kind of a huge service that, you know, um, you know, made may, may people realize, you know, this is a place with civility and so society and things like that as well. The wilderness was uh, becoming educated, self-educated and self-taught. Uh, that, that's wonderful. I hope folks are taking this opportunity to uh, send in any questions. This is your, uh, your opportunity to see uh, uh, that. One, one other uh, to hear about the history, uh, when you showed the wonderful image, you said that predated uh, the Lafayette Hotel. Uh, 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 obviously, the Civil War monument was there. Was that originally the courthouse? Is that the image of the courthouse? And, and then it was converted into the library? Or was there a, a, some other building built before the 1965 one, obviously? But uh, what there was a separate courthouse. Uh, we do have an image of it um, at the Grosvenor Room. You can come in and take a look. And I, I think it might be posted on our website as well. There was an actual courthouse and jail there, um, which leads to, you know, some statements, people thinking that the library is haunted because, um, uh. you know, some uh, famous uh, <laughs> uh, trials and things happened there. Um, but that building was, my understanding is that the building had been, the courthouse had been um, abandoned and hadn't been used for many years. So 
the county provided the site as, and it was demolished and the new, the Eadlitz library was built on top of that. So that's the new library at that time, obviously. Right, in 1890, in 18, yeah, in the, the end of the, the 19th century. Yeah, that was the new library. And then um, when the building that we, that is standing now was built, what happened was is they built the back section of the library um, first there was because we acquired a whole additional city block of storage space so they built that first and then they knocked down the old library and then built the new facade that you see front structure um afterwards that's my understanding of how that happened Good. leah how are we doing for questions we have one question so far is there a book about the library's history tracing back 184 years yep so um it, it, it's in my, uh, it's uh, the exact, there are several, there are many, and they are at the, uh, you can come and read them at the Grosvenor Room. Um, a lot of them are available on um, Google Book because they're kind of free and uh, they're, you know, they're out of copyright. But um, the one that's really fun about the building, the Edlitz building, um, that's the one with the really long title, the Buffalo Library and its building illustrated with views, also brief historical sketches of the Buffalo Fine Arts Academy, the Buffalo Society of Natural Sciences and the Buffalo Historical Historical Society, which occur, occupy parts of the same building. <laughs> that was actually published in 1887 when the, that new library was built. And there's some wonderful images in there. Um, it shows examples. We the, the lighting system was both electric and gas, so you could toggle between depending on conditions. Um, and then um, there, there was a retrospective, a 100-year retrospective that was published in 1936. And then a final one, um, 1940 to 1975, um, that was, the time was right, and that's about how the three systems consolidated into one. Um, a lot of them are probably still av uh, available to check out in the, um, in the system, but you can certainly come and look. The Grosvenor Room is a the, the rare books in uh, local history department. It's referenced, so you can't check anything out of that room, but it does guarantee that you'll always be able to find them. <laughs> so that's really right. helpful. And, and they also have, I've had a really great time pouring over the annual reports. They used to publish the annual reports for the libraries every year for both Grosvenor and, um, and, and, and the Buffalo Library. And they have lots of cool anecdotes and little, they would write little histories of uh, the city and things that are going out, that were going, happening outside in the wider world as well. And so they're really fun to look at. Great, thank you. Susan, those, those uh, annual reports must be online on the library's website perhaps um there there are many there they, they end up being quite they're actually quite large but those are those you can actually find on google book they've been digitized okay yeah. um so if you if you can actually probably just google yma and buffalo and you will start finding different annual reports but they are they are bound and kept in the grovener room as well there's a lot of statistics that uh, I see on the wall often about the library uh, relative to usage, numbers of people, numbers of books, uh, uh, videos. Uh, uh, is, is there some that come to mind that you think are really the essence of saying, wow, this is a major community resource? What, uh, how, how does that, what's the best measurements to, to um, claim that? Well, you're right. Every year we do come up with some fine statistics. And I know, for example, I believe it was just recently, um, we've checked out 1 million ebooks um, through the, uh, is that right, Leah? Is it something like a million ebooks, something like that? It's something um, like that, yeah. Yeah. And so even during the pandemic, you know, we've been here, the library is here for people between online programming. If you have, you know, I mean, you're all here. Um, so you know about the things that we offer. But if you look at our Facebook page or our YouTube page, there's just been so so much um, collective creativity throughout the system of people sharing um, story times, cooking programs, uh, wonderful lectures such as this. Um, and you'll see the participation um, either if you go and look on YouTube or on, on Facebook that people care about their libraries, people care about their librarians. They, you know, uh, especially, you know, families love checking in um, online with their favorite librarians because, you know, in not just here at Central, but all throughout the system, um, you know, it's all about personal relationships, you know, and I think that 
you know, numbers are awesome and amazing, but it's the personal relationships that really, that really matter, I think, in libraries and the idea of making community. And I think that, you know, in the center of every town, basically, almost every town in, in, in Erie County, um, there's going to be city hall and down the street or town hall, there's going to be your public library, you know, so... It, while the numbers are great, I think we, we, I think the circulation, I can't off the top of my head, I think it's something like 4 million books a year or something like that. But, you know, sometimes it goes beyond the numbers too. And, um, you know, those community connections, I think are so very important as well. Totally agree. Totally agree. What, uh, I, and just since we've been living with COVID-19 for the last couple of years, uh, the last time, a hundred years ago, when the was the library uh, affected in your research at all uh, uh, by the what was then called the uh, Span uh, what uh, the Spanish epidemic, uh, Spanish flu? Right. But uh, dropping that, I mean, it was a couple of years of bad times. Uh, didn't they didn't have uh, vaccines or anything of that sort? Uh, how did how was the library? Was it is there records of people wearing masks or not wearing masks or talking about it, or is it just a, a forgotten episode? I have seen in some of the annual reports, people would be writing about certain branches and it wasn't just uh, uh, the flu, there would be other epidemics um, that would pop up and it seems like they would, you know, it'd be kind of casual. They'd be like, you know, William Ives was closed for three months due to illness, you know. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know, I can't remember off the top of my head, it was like cholera or, or what it was that people were mm -hmm. getting, but I think that epidemics and closing was much more of a part of daily life than we even realize um but you know they would close you know it seemed like it was neighborhood by neighborhood that they would be um shutting down and yeah it's kind of interesting i don't i haven't run into any pictures but i think it was just a lot more a uh, part of life uh back then than we even than we even think of because it would be pretty casual they're like oh william i just closed for three months because of you know illness you know or, or this place was closed oh it hit our statistics you know like that would be they'd be worried like our numbers are down but you know we were closed so you know um i think it was just a part of life and um but we all still had the same worries like you know we're still doing service we're still here you know <laughs> we're still providing the service just in a safe way but um indeed the library has been that constant uh, uh i know it shut down for a while but you were uh the spot uh, for wi-fi for students working on uh, uh internet projects that might not have had their own access so uh it's an amazing service that uh, uh as you pointed out was the home base for uh, i believe all our culturals from the albright knox uh, what's now the albright knox to the museum of science to uh, the History Museum. Uh, in many ways, uh, when I had first heard that, uh, it became the, the basis for uh, this Imagine program of saying in a digital age, how can the library at least be a platform for connecting all those various cultural organizations that uh, had their start initially with the library. Uh, so that's that's been the fun from my standpoint to watch this program uh, uh, and now, especially that it can archive a program like this and all the other uh, culturals that we've done over those 445 <laughs> imagined programs, uh, all of them at least audio recorded, but uh, the last 70 or so uh, on a video format, this uh, virtual format. So it's a great service. It, By the way, all of these can be, again, found on the library's YouTube channel. Uh, and I'll mention one other that's, uh, folks, the, the library's always done a great job of creating uh, exhibits. Uh, and they're up like any uh, art gallery exhibit or history museum exhibit. They're up for a period of time, and then they're taken down. But a few years ago, we started uh, archiving them uh, with new formats, uh, 3D uh, virtual reality. And the library's created a link. You can find it on their homepage, uh, 3D VR. And uh, rooms like the Mark Twain room that are uh, permanent exhibits uh, are on that for teachers, educators, uh, 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 past exhibits on slavery uh, that was up a couple years ago uh, is on the 
the, um, I think, B for books, the current exhibit has uh, certainly uh, been captured. I, uh, uh, it, I believe it's on the website. So um, um, check that out, folks. Uh, it's a great resource. It's, uh, it helps move the library forward into the 21st century and, and, uh, uh, and the use of technology uh, uh, for place, what I call place-based lifelong learners of all ages. So Susan, that was uh, a great presentation and, a, and a, I think this will be a good archive piece of uh, the history of the library within the context of the history of the uh, celebration uh, of the 200th anniversary of Erie County itself. All right, so next week we have um, uh, Simone Raglan. Uh, she's the executive director of uh, Western New York STEM, Science, Technology, uh, Engineering, and Math. Um, uh, the uh, founder of that uh, would come to many of the Imagine series and uh, uh, we, we, uh, she was from out of town and it's been nice to watch them grow and be such an important player. It's our fourth Tuesday program around science and nature. So we hope you'll uh, come by next week as well to uh, get an update on Western New York STEM. I'm Dennis Galecki. Thank you again, Susan. And thank you folks for all participating today. Uh, you show up so that uh, we show up uh, and have this little half hour get together. Uh, wish you all well, be well, and good afternoon. <laughs>